Dr. Fazal Rahana is an American biochemist who has disgraced himself in the scientific endeavor in making every attempt to force science to fit his biblical perspective. Ignoring the evidence, retrofitting what we observe and simply drawing on every trick at the apologist's disposal, he's made a career acting as the pseudo-scientific face for biblical creationism. Uh, I currently work for a ministry called Reasons to Believe, and the focus of our ministry is to show how the latest discoveries in science provide evidence for God's existence and the reliability of scripture. Uh, I'm a biochemist by training, uh, and, and this idea of using science as a way to build a bridge to the gospel is really very important to me. Today's video is a snippet from an interview he did for Jude Free Project titled Rethinking Evolution, though I first came across it on Reasons to Believe, where it was titled What Darwin Never Knew. And that leads to, to, the, to my next question. What do you think the two most um, significant scientific facts that if Darwin had known might have greatly impacted his theory? Yeah, well, that, that's, uh, you know, those are, those are fun questions to speculate about. And, you know, it's interesting when Darwin wrote um, on the origin of species, he had an entire chapter devoted to uh, difficulties with his theory. And so these were places where he realized that there were features in nature that didn't line up with what he would have expected if indeed his theory was valid. And so Darwin was intellectually honest in, in pointing out those difficulties with his theory. And those are great places to start in terms of uh, uh, asking the question, you know, if Darwin knew then what we know now, would he have advanced this theory? Darwin was indeed critical of his own work, being rather open about the many questions that plagued his mind. Rather lightheartedly, he wrote to a colleague in the year of 1860, describing how the sight of a peacock feather made him feel ill. But as witty as his remark was, the issue had been a real one surrounding explaining sexual dimorphism through evolutionary heritage. How could such vast differences between male and female arise when clearly one form was better for survival? A peahen free of the tail feathers of the peacock has better camouflage and can fly faster for longer without the extra weight. And it was by acknowledging said issue that Darwin was able to uncover more about the way in which evolution operated. It was the peacock and various other creatures that led him to first describe a second force of selection. He named it sexual selection to describe selection occurring within the species in how members of one sex often selected members of another sex with the most desirable traits. Given time these traits compound and exaggerate, sometimes spectacularly resulting in the sexual dimorphism we see in such animals today. Sadly, Darwin did not figure out all his little mysteries, passing the baton onto scientists ever since to continue his work and so they do. Uh, one thing that Darwin lamented about was the way the fossil record looked, the patterns in the fossil record. Because Darwin expected that evolution would happen gradually. Well, if that was the case, then the fossil record should show gradual evolutionary transformations. It should show um, a lot of transitional forms. But instead, what the fossil record in Darwin's day showed were, were that groups would appear suddenly uh, without any kind of history preceding them in an evolutionary sense. And then they would remain unchanged or, or static before they would disappear from the fossil record. Uh, so that troubled Darwin. Well, there are several claims here presented as one single claim that we need to untangle. For a start, these periods of sudden evolution were not preceded by times without any sort of evolutionary history. But we will return to this with what you're about to state in a minute. But going back to the problem itself, it's true. Darwin did note the fact that at times the fossil records seemed to gradually evolve, whilst in others the changes were far more sudden. Now the terms gradual and sudden here are somewhat misleading in a layman's sense. When we're talking about gradual evolution as centered by the phyletic gradualism, we are talking about a time scale involving hundreds, if not several hundred million years for a new distinct branch of the tree of life to emerge. When discussing sudden evolution as forwarded by punctuated equilibrium, a term coined in a 1972 paper by Niles Eldridge and Stephen Jay Gould, we are talking about a timescale involving tens of millions of years. Fact is, Darwin did not hold to a stable form of phyletic gradualism as some people assume. In his book The Origin of Species, he states the following on page 313. Species of different genera and classes have not changed at the same rate, or in the same degree. In the oldest territory beds, a few living shells may still be found in the midst of a multitude of extinct forms. 
Falconer has given a striking instance of a similar fact in an existing crocodile associated with many strange and lost mammals and reptiles in the sub-Himalayan deposits. The Siluan lingula differs but little from the living species of this genus, whereas most of the other Silurian mollusks and all the other crustaceans have changed greatly. End quote. Then on the next page he also adds, quote, These several facts accord well with my theory. I believe in no fixed law development, causing all the inhabitants of a country to change abruptly, or simultaneously, or to an equal degree. The process of modification must be extremely slow. The variability of each species is quite independent of that of all others. Whether such variability be taken advantage of by natural selection, and whether the variations be accumulated to a greater or lesser amount, thus causing a greater or lesser amount of modification in varying species, depends on many complex contingencies. On the variability being of a beneficial nature, on the power of intercrossing, on the rate of breeding, on the slowly changing physical conditions of the country, and more especially on the nature of the other inhabitants with which the varying species comes into competition. Hence, it is by no means surprising that one species should retain the same identical form much longer than others, or, if changing, that it should change less. End quote. So this topic certainly was one of the discussions Darwin had in his book, but to say it's one of the problems that troubled Darwin is somewhat disingenuous. He acknowledged it and formed his theory around it, not holding to a stable rate of evolution, but allowing for some variations. Yes, he still says evolution is gradual, but this is perfectly acceptable as a description of these poorly described sudden surges in evolution, which, as already mentioned, still take place over tens of millions of years, just not hundreds of millions of years. It's still relatively sudden, but still incredibly gradual. I mean, the agricultural revolution that allowed for the foundation of civilization as we know it is thought to have taken place roughly 10,000 years ago. Recorded history only goes as far back as 5,000 years ago. We could live the agricultural revolution through to the atomic age a hundred times, 200 times if we start from recorded history, and that's within the low end of the quote, sudden evolutionary timescale of 10 million years. So it's still pretty gradual, only being relatively sudden when compared to phyletic gradualism. Uh, but in addition to that, Darwin was aware of something called the, what we now call today the Cambrian Explosion. And this is an event in life's history where out of nowhere, complex animals show up suddenly in the fossil record. The, these are called the Cambrian strata. And uh, be beneath those strata of rocks, there's nothing. There's no evolutionary history. Then suddenly, this explosion of animal forms takes place. And, and Darwin was very troubled by that. Well, what's interesting is Darwin said, look, if, if we uh, continue to collect more fossils uh, and study geological layers, these problems are going to evaporate. That's what he wrote in The Origin of Species. Well, it's interesting, 160 years later, the fossil record in terms of its pattern still looks the same. Things show up suddenly in the fossil record, they remain unchanged and then they disappear. There's a dearth of transitional intermediate forms and the Cambrian explosion looks like it's a real event that today defies evolutionary explanation. This wasn't even true at the time of Darwin's death. Prior to the Cambrian, we had the period known as the Edicarian, and living within it, we had the Edicarian biota. Biota being the scientific way to say animal and plant life in relation to a specific location, or as in this instance, a period in history. Now, the first scientifically acknowledged Edicarian fossil was found no later than 1868, a mere nine years after Darwin first published Origin of Species, and a full 14 years before he sadly passed away. But this is in no way the earliest life on record. We have cyanobacteria dating back as far as 2.7 billion years ago, with further evidence possibly dating back 3.5 billion years. However, that is in no way as conclusive as the evidence dating back 2.7 billion years. So to get to the claim that there is no evidence of life prior to the Cambrian, you have to ignore the first 2,183 million years of the fossil record. The Cambrian explosion was not a sudden appearance of life without gradual adaptation, but a surge in evolution spanning 20 to 25 million years, 
as a time period. Now part of this evolution was the emergence of hard tissue, often in the form of shells. Now if you've ever studied fossilization, you know that any fossil is rare, but a fossil of a creature comprised entirely of soft tissue is even rarer. Therefore it's not surprising that we see a sudden boom in the number of fossils following the Cambrian, since as already mentioned, one of the iconic features of said evolutionary event was the emergence of hard tissue. Hard tissue which fossilizes better. Fact is, we have an idea as to why this happened, namely changes in the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere. Thankfully I already had the footwork down for this, having learnt more on the topic from the wonderful Wildwood Clare. The chart I am now displaying on screen shows the estimated oxygen levels over the history of the earth. The red bar, which I have just added, represents the Cambrian period, and the yellow bar represents the earlier Avalon period, during which we saw the Avalon explosion, which gave us the before mentioned Edicarian biota that predated the Cambrian biota by about 33 million years. Now this would suggest that the increasing oxygen levels likely played a role in the sudden radiation of life during both the Avalon period and the Cambrian period, as well as possibly explains the appearance of hard-shelled creatures during the later Cambrian explosion. So we can see how geologically sudden changes in environmental pressures likely had some involvement with both events. What this means in relation to your argument is that the assertion that changes in biodiversity over this 20 to 25 million year period somehow defy scientific explanation are without merit. As for a lack of transitional forms, this is once again a claim that can only be made in an eclipsing ignorance or outright denial of all the evidence available. We not only have an abundance of key transitional forms, but have actually observed the process of evolution in action. We have observed the evolution of entirely new genetic material that was beneficial to an organism under lab conditions. Lastly, dealing with the idea that we don't see change outside of said punctuated equilibrium, this is simply not true. Even organisms which are often described as being living fossils such as sharks and crocodiles are touted as having continued to survive relatively unchanged. An immediately obvious way they've changed is in their size. Contrary to the wishes of the people at the Discovery Channel, sharks the size of Megalodon no longer swim in our oceans today, and crocodilians the size of Deinonychus no longer patrol our rivers. That is change. That is observable. That's a fact. So when you just look at, at the, the difficulties that Darwin identified uh, and, and realize that those difficulties persist today, that to me is, is reason, I think, if you're a thinking person, to, to be skeptical that, of maybe the grand claim that evolution can explain everything in biology. Mm -hmm. that's, that's very helpful. No, it's really not. It's dishonest, it's ill-informed and opportunistic, sure, but helpful is not the term I'd use to describe it. There are some things I can forgive your average person for not knowing, but there's a lot here that anyone who's looked at the subject for more than 30 seconds will know and yet is being ignored. Instead we get the same old baseless crap asserted time and time again. Evolution does not explain everything in biology, nobody claims such. What it does do is explain the origins of biodiversity. Now this in turn unifies many fields of biology, but just because it touches on nearly every field of biology does not then correlate to it explaining everything. This entire display has been one bad joke not befitting a doctor of biochemistry. Hi there, I'd just like to say a few things here at the end of the video before you go. First of all, I'd like to thank everyone who's ever donated to the channel via Patreon, giving a special thanks to the following people. Hannah Banghart, Matthew Kovac, John Schoenrock, Daniel Martinez, and Alexander Williams. Your support has ensured this channel its ability to grow over the years. I'd also like to ask that you comment down below and like this video, as well as subscribe, hit the bell icon, and follow Essence of Thought on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Please also consider following Atheist Alliance International on Facebook, a humanist organisation dedicated to helping atheists around the globe. Lastly, I'd like to request that you treat the people responded to in this video with a reasonable degree of respect. Whilst we understand that there are justifiable limits to said respect when tackling certain heavy topics and anger can be a genuine emotion in fighting injustice, 
Any comments utilizing language which insults others on the basis of perceived gender, sexuality, ethnicity or ability both mental and physical will be removed immediately and the commenter may be blocked on the moderator's discretion. Let's work to keep this space one which upholds the values of humanism. Thank you.